as many of us know, or all of us uh, know, the Bible is full of, of different genres of writing. Uh, there's historical narrative uh, in the scriptures. There's poetry and song. Uh, there's prophecy. There's apocalyptic uh, literature, epistles and letters. That's part of what makes the scriptures as a, as a book, a God's book, so rich. And one of the very distinct writings in the Bible would be the four gospel accounts. Uh, the closest thing we have to the Gospels would be what we know of as biography. Uh, but, but of course, when you read biographies, you're reading about a person's life, uh, their background, their character, the things they did, perhaps the legacy that they uh, leave behind. But in no biography do you read that, that, the, that the purpose of the person's life, that the reason he or she came into the world was in order to die. That, that their death was actually the purpose for their life. That's what you have in the Gospels. That's part of what makes the Gospels as literature so unique. The Gospels, unlike biography, reveal the reason for Christmas, the reason for this day, the reason for the coming of Christ was in order that he would offer him, himself a, a substitute for sin. And we learn through the Gospels that uh, there's an emphasis both upon the humility, the suffering of the Lord Jesus, but they also emphasize his lordship, his exaltation, that he's king of kings. And as you consider uh, church history among theologians and renowned preachers, some of them have been called theologians of the cross, uh, giving greater emphasis in their teaching and their thinking upon the, the humiliation of Christ, the lowliness of Christ. And there have been other theologians and, and preachers who have been known as theologians of glory, simply giving greater weight to Christ's majesty, his exaltation. What do you tend to emphasize more? Where does your heart and mind go to more? Do you tend to see Christ first in his lowliness, in his humility, in his suffering, or Christ in his kingship, his exaltation, his majesty? Well, before you answer that, as we come to our final servant song, the fourth song or description of this servant in Isaiah, as you heard read earlier uh, from uh, Isaiah 40, from Isaiah 40 to 55, there's a turning point there uh, Isaiah's looking down, uh, communicating really to those who would be in exile in Babylon. And he's giving them, among other things, these descriptions of this figure that will come to give them life, restore the people of God. So we come to the fourth and final servant song. It's Isaiah 52, beginning at verse 13 through chapter 53. And we see this servant both as sufferer but also as exalted Lord. Both of those themes run through this text, as you'll see. Isaiah 52, beginning at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root, out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. 
and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Likely there is no place in all of the Old Testament where the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ shines more clearly, more brightly than here, than here in Isaiah 53. And if there's been any doubt as to the identity of this servant in these servant songs, the New Testament authors in at least two different places identify this servant in this text with Jesus of Nazareth, the Lord Jesus Christ. One is Peter, the Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He says of Jesus that he bore our sins in his body on the tree, and then he references verse 5 of our text. By his wounds... You have been healed. And then also in Acts chapter 8, the New Testament author Luke, recording Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian official, tells us that as Philip approached the official, the official was reading from Isaiah. And the text says this in Acts 8.32. The passage of Scripture that the official was reading was this, quote, like a sheep led to the slaughter, Like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. And the Ethiopian asks Philip, about whom does the prophet speak? Who is the prophet speaking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And Philip, beginning with the scriptures, told him about the good news in Jesus. What is this good news here in Isaiah 53? Well, I want us to see a few things that Isaiah sees in this text. Several things. First, Isaiah sees rebellion. He sees rebel subjects. Verse 1 of chapter 53, those questions, who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who's believed this message that we've heard? The answer to those rhetorical questions is essentially hardly anyone. Almost no one. And why? Why is it in Isaiah's day or in our own day can there be such widespread rejection and unbelief? Well, one of the answers comes in verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. Think about that. Think about the ungrateful rebellion revealed in those words. Isaiah 43, verse 7, says that God made people for His glory. But like sheep, we've turned to our own way. If you have a study Bible, I use an ESV study Bible. I I use the study notes quite a bit, uh, the comments. I glanced down in my preparation. I wonder what they say about sheep. You know, you always hear people talking about the different characteristics of sheep. Well, here's what it says. 
Quote, the words like sheep, stupid and helpless. Merry Christmas. <laughs> so encouraging. Thanks for that profundity. <laughs> like sheep, stupid and helpless. Uh, if you want to know what this rebellion, though, looks like, most often rebellion doesn't come in the form of some passionate atheism. It can. Or throwing one's fist at God sort of in an expressed anger. It looks like sheep going their own way, doing their own thing. The easiest way to be a rebel against the true king, to be in rebellion but not feel like a rebel, is to simply put the king out of one's mind. Simply live the way one wants. Do what they want to do. Then it doesn't really feel like rebellion. It just feels like I'm being a responsible person. That's how Isaiah begins. Man's condition. His rebellious condition. How, how necessary to see in order for the gospel to be seen. Give me my own way. And what do rebels do with kings? They reject him. So you've got rebellion, and then you've got rejection, the next thing Isaiah sees. So verse 3, he was despised. The servant was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Why despise and reject this servant? Why would that happen? I think the answer in part is in verse 2. He grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. You see the picture? Like a root out of dry ground. It's not a flower. It's not something attractive. It's the picture of a root in a parched land, struggling to preserve life, struggling to stay alive. It's suffering. It's the opposite picture of a tall cedar or a great oak tree. If you want to see those, the sequoias, redwoods, you go out to California, you can see huge trees, 30 feet wide in diameter, 250 feet tall. And it'll leave you in awe and wonder. People drive their way out there to go see them because they're wonderful. But this is a lowly root. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, that we should desire him. Isaiah uses the present in this, that we should desire him or that we see him. He, he sees the image, the picture of the Messiah before his own eyes. And we ought to personalize this for ourselves as well. Naturally, I don't desire this servant those two words, form and majesty, he had no form or majesty, are two nouns that communicate comeliness, beauty, handsomeness. This is what King David had in 1 Samuel 16. A man of good presence, handsome in form and appearance. And this is what man naturally looks for in a leader. Good appearance. But the servant did not have the form or that majesty, neither in outward appearance or in his message. One person put it this way. The servant's whole demeanor, his style, his view of life and money and possessions and lust and prayer and worship and pride and humility and fear and faith, none of it endorsed our own rebellion. So this is the hard news of what Isaiah sees. He sees rebellion and he sees rejection. But then what Isaiah sees next is not just good news. It is shocking. It's shocking news. Because the rejected servant becomes a ransom. He becomes a ransoming servant. The rejection doesn't surprise the servant. Remember, remember Jesus' own words in, in Mark 10. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. He, he knows his calling. What do 
earthly kings do with rebel subjects. They destroy them, or imprison them, or rid them. But what does this servant do? The the move, the transition from verse 3 into 4 and following strikes at the very core and heart of the good news. The good news spoken about throughout the scriptures. Verse 4, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. By His wounds we are healed. We've gone astray, but the Lord, Yahweh, laid on the servant the iniquity, the sin of us all. That is all substitutionary language. He's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, pierced for us, crushed for us. It's substitutionary language. The remedy to our rebellion and sin is not just a a redirected path in life. That comes for those of us who are Christians. We're set on a, a new path. But the remedy amidst the crushing reality and weight of sin is a servant who is crushed with us and for us. He brings all of our sin, draws it to a point, and he puts it to death on the cross. This this is salvation. This is what we love about our Lord Jesus Christ. How he draws near and takes upon himself our own burden and our own sin. That is salvation. Dr. Edmund Clowney, the the late professor at Westminster Seminary, was once asked, if you only had one text of Scripture that you could preach on, what would it be? And he was quite quick. He said, uh, you might be thinking I'm going to say Isaiah 53. No, it's not what he said. Actually, he said, of course, it'd be Jonah 2.9. But he didn't just say Jonah 2.9. He said Jonah 2.9c. You're thinking, what's Jonah 2.9c? Here's Jonah. He himself is in rebellion in a way. He's running from the call of the Lord to proclaim the message of of, of repentance and salvation, uh, judgment for the Ninevites, running away, finds himself in the sea, spiraling down and down, and then this great fish, really a picture of, of a Savior, comes, swallows him up. And in the midst of the belly of the fish, Jonah prays with thanks. And you come to the end of that prayer. He calls to the Lord out of distress. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, you heard my voice and I offer my thanks. And then the last line, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. If I only had one text, I don't know that it would be Jonah 2.9c. But I know that Isaiah 53 would be toward the top. This is a picture of salvation. This is how John Stott put it. In order to save us in such a way as to satisfy himself, God, through Christ, substituted himself for us. Divine love triumphed over divine wrath by divine self-sacrifice. That's the love of our God. You see, he doesn't make things right by merely straightening out that which is broken, but by being broken, crushed in our place. Uh, You may or may not know the story of of Dick and Ricky Hoyt, the father-son relationship beginning when Ricky was born in 1962, I believe, in Holland, Mass. In fact, he uh, died just uh, last year in 2021. He was born with uh, cerebral palsy. He would be confined to a wheelchair for all of his life. Uh, When he was quite young, uh, some suggested and encouraged to the parents that they put him in some kind of of institution, but they said, nope, he's coming home with us. As he grew up, he heard of a, a running charity as a teenager on the television. A charity event, a running charity event for a paralyzed athlete. Uh, Ricky asked his dad, and his dad said, yes. 
And that began a decades-long journey of father and son entering into these running and cycling events together. His father, Dick, always carrying or pushing him in a custom uh, wheelchair. Well, one of the events of interest to me was the Ironman, a full-distance triathlon. Now, you can look this up. You can see videos. It's quite moving, at least to me. Uh, to see this father swim two and a half miles with a harness around his chest, carrying his son in a raft, getting on a bike for over 112 miles of cycling with his son on a seat before him, carrying him, and then running a full marathon, uh, pushing his son along. And you can see Ricky has a smile on his face, tears in his eyes. And he says, when I'm with my dad out on the course, I don't feel any pain. I don't feel my condition. It's a wonderful picture of entering into another's lowly, hard condition and doing for them what they cannot do for themselves. That's what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. This is true for us. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But it doesn't quite end there. The gospel does not save without one seeing it and grasping it for their own. And so that's the last thing that I want to point out Isaiah sees. It's the restoration of spiritual sight. In verse 15 of chapter 52, So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has, has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Kings and people, they shut their mouths. That, that is, they are in awe of his humiliation and his suffering. But notice what it is that brings light to their eyes. The, it is the sprinkling of the servant. He shall sprinkle many nations. That word sprinkle is a technical word that we find in the Mosaic Law. Sprinkling with water, with oil, with blood. It's a word of purification. His sprinkled blood purifies, cleanses, washes away. But notice one verse back, what it is that brought the sprinkling. The servants shed blood, verse 14. Many were astonished. His appearance was so marred, beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the children of mankind. From his suffering, his image was so marred, so disfigured, people believed he was being punished for his own sins. When in fact his suffering was the condition in which he would bring cleansing to the nations. The, the gospel of Isaiah, the gospel of Christ, is good news not only because the suffering servant is a ransom for many, but by his suffering and his sprinkled blood, he opens the eyes of kings and of nations. This is Paul's prayer in part for the Ephesians. That the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened to know the hope to which they've been called. As we come to the close of 2022, what are the main stories going to be that capture the year? I was doing some searching. Here's some of the things that came up. Inflation surging around the world, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, the passing away of Queen Elizabeth II. To be sure, there's many stories that have given shape to people's lives and cities and even nations uh, this past year. But this is the story, this is the story we're to live in. This is the story God's saving and His rescuing grace uh, through the coming of the suffering servant that is to give most shape, most definition uh, to our lives, to our faith, to our calling as the people of God. We think of Paul's words in, Ephesians, or in Philippians 3. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, be found in him, 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we praise you for your abundant grace that you have poured out, displayed in the life, in the suffering, in the death of this servant, our precious Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And yet how we praise you that death could not hold him, that he is the risen one, he is exalted, seated at your right hand. Lord, we praise you for Christmas, for your visitation of us, for breaking into this world and beginning to put it to right again, redeeming and restoring it, and catching up catching us up in that wave of restoration. Lord, fill our hearts and and our minds with praise and and thanks, with joy and and hope, O Lord, as we commit our way unto you, as we meditate upon uh, the reality of this uh, suffering servant for us. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us as a people. Uh, Lord, that we would be attentive uh, to the working of your Spirit, that we would keep in step with the Spirit, Lord, uh, as you lead us. We thank you uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, that he has all power, authority, and dominion. Uh, We yield to you, we yield to him, and we give thanks for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.